insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com. Marcia Kavanaugh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, as the mayoral election intensifies, not only are there more debates, but this week there was a debate about debates. We'll join the discussion. A newspaper feature has raised its own debate about the area's economic future. We'll take a look. We'll also examine the cost of Mike Yenny's fancy office and making the turbines work at the Sewage and Water Board. Our Future Watch segment updates the progress on the new VA hospital. And some players sat on the bench, and it was their choice. On the field for us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Catherine Sayer, investigative reporter, NOLA.com, The Times Picayune. First, we're going to go over to Errol, and let's talk about those debates uh, slash forums. We seem to have a multitude of them in this election cycle, certainly for mayor. Well, a couple of things about debates is one is that they're best remembered when something unusual, bizarre happens. If you have a straight, honest, back and forth discussion of the issues, people would say, okay, what's on next? You know? But when something unusual happens, and that's what happened um, this week, this was Sidney Torres' uh, much ballyhooed debate that he sponsored his PAC, PAC, which he calls uh, Voice PAC, put it on. And the big story out of that, what left everybody talking, was Desiree Charbonnet uh, decided not to be part of the debate. This was apparently a, a last minute decision and she, of course, being one of the front runners, uh, rankled Mr. Torres, who said he would use his PAC money to go out and, and attack her in, in, in campaigns. We don't know for sure what happened, but it seems like getting the bits and pieces uh, is that uh, two TV stations, when they have reporters uh, asking questions as part of the debate, uh, Channel 6 and Channel 8, and they withdrew from the last moment. Uh, we don't know f fully what they did, but apparently one reason, one thing that seemed to disturb people is that Sidney Torres was going to be one of the panelists, and some people didn't think that that was going to be appropriate. We, we, again, we don't know the full, uh, the, the, the full story yet. But the other thing is, is that it really wasn't a debate. All right? If you looked at, at the rules there, it what's happened to this this thing this uh, that goes on in campaigns is that candidates have gotten pretty much skilled at writing their demands to favor them. And there were so many rules in this in this campaign, including some um, that the uh, the Charbonnet campaign wanted in terms of of preparation for it. You, you can't talk about this. You can't talk about that. Uh, the candidates got to see the questions beforehand. I mean, as journalists, being in something where you show the people. David, when you're interviewing somebody, do you show them the questions beforehand? Absolutely. Ever, 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 okay? Never uh, would agree to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so to me, it was more of a fool. And there couldn't be any debate. There couldn't be any interchange. And so they, they went around and they asked everybody the questions that they knew that they were going to be asked. And so, and so what this did, I, I don't know. But the other thing, you know, people wonder, well, you know, if Charbonnet didn't show up, will this hurt her? And there's not much evidence to believe that not being in debates hurts candidates. And the case in point was Bobby Jindal. Uh, Bobby Jindal had a very successful career. I mean, he, he lost the first time he ran for governor, but finished in the runoff. But every other time he won, and he always avoided debates. Uh, maybe during the campaign he'd do two. But uh, left unchallenged, there'd be debates every night, all day long, because every organization out there would say, let's get all the candidates, let's mm -hmm. have a debate. And so pretty much the candidates have to say no. But I don't think there's this public demand out there for more and more debates, nor is there anybody in the public keeping count in terms of who shows up where. And so I think the candidates know how to, uh, how to figure out what the really key debates are. Usually they're, uh, they're debates run by the media and, or, or, and sponsored perhaps by a group like the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. that has some kind of a reputation behind it. Um, but the debate is not always all that it's intended to be. And again, what they're best remembered for is, is when things happen, like if somebody forget something. Uh, I remember when there was a good material debate and Bob Livingston, who was a very bright man, a very respected congressman, and he was asked a question about education. In the middle of his answer, he just 
forgot his point. He forgot what he was saying. And, and that's all that people were talking about uh, the next day. And of course, there's the famous Republican debate in the oops moment for yeah. the former governor, uh, Texas, uh, Texas Governor Rick Perry. Um, and on and the, the other hand, when Kathleen Blanco ran for governor, and um, there was some sort of issue, and she made reference to um, a son who was injured in like an oil accident, and there was this very emotional sob when she said it, and that really resonated with the public, and, and that really helped her. I, I'm not saying she did it on purpose, but it was, it was one of those moments that helped. So, so do you think that this has an impact on Charbonnet at this no. point? Give it no. I don't think it does, because uh, we know there's going to be at least two more television debates right. uh, that will be coming up. And you know, I think ultimately people don't make that many decisions based on the issues, because all the candidates are pretty much the same area on issues. I mean, everybody's against crime. I mean, I mean, you, you know, they're, they're, they're and all, good drainage. Yeah, yeah. And, and they want good yeah. drainage. And they're all against increased taxes. And so you really don't learn that much. And so what influences people's vote is all the other stuff. I mean, uh, they're influenced by who's endorsing whom. Uh, who, who is it that I relate to that because this person's endorsing them, I can do them. Uh, I think all those things become, become more effective than a debate unless, unless there's a big mistake made, and we, we, which will undermine someone. Two weeks, right? Two, Two weeks. weeks until the primary. Okay. All right, over to Catherine right now. And you guys started a series um, at the Times Picayunanola.com. You call it a tipping point, sort of taking a look at where is New Orleans positioned now in these 12 years since Katrina and all the changes we've experienced. Yeah, this is a project that I'm working on with my colleague, uh, Chelsea Braystead. Um, it kind of came out of my business beat reporting, my real estate beat reporting, and then just talking with friends and people I know in New Orleans about the sense that maybe the economy is losing some steam, right? Right. Um, after this 10 years of um, sort of a post-Katrina boom, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, at least on the on the surface, right? Um, so taking a look at how much of the economic growth has been perception versus reality, and then also how much of the sense that maybe we're losing steam is, is a matter of perception mm -hmm. or reality. Uh, and so we're really reaching out, trying, we're, you know, introduced the series a couple of weeks ago, asking for readers to give us their input too. So to a large degree, we hope it'll be driven by readers and we've gotten a big response. Mm -hmm. But some of the things we're tackling are like the growth of the tech industry. There's been a lot of talk about that. You have big standout companies like Lucid um, that have, um, been successful, but you can't really name a whole crop of them yet, right? Mm -hmm. So where do we stand there? Um, I did a story about minority-owned businesses and how they've been left out of the entrepreneurial scene, mm -hmm. you know, with Idea Village and Propeller and some of the things that Propeller's trying to do to increase um, equity and racial equity, uh, to improve equity. Um, so, 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 so oh, those are some of the right, issues right. we'll be looking at. Like the, uh, some of the long-term businesses here, some of the small shops that have been around pre-Katrina days, they're, they're looking for some assistance from some of these groups that facilitate assistance, right? Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's one of the things I really hope we can accomplish, and I feel like we have so far, is making this sort of solution-oriented, mm -hmm. not just pointing out, like, oh, look, everything's terrible, right? <laughs> I do think there are, and not just and not just in what, what government can do, but really getting out into what people in their communities, what people in the private sector are doing and talking about. I think there's a lot going on that we just have not uncovered. A lot of people doing some pretty interesting work. Um, and it was interesting, we, we started out reporting the series and then Amazon came out and said they're gonna be looking for uh, a, another city to um, open a second headquarters, mm -hmm. HQ2, as they're talking about. I'm sure you guys have all heard about that. Right. Yeah. And New Orleans is putting a bid together. So um, I don't know. I was not here before Katrina. I kind of wonder if the city would have even been a contender before Katrina. What do you all think? I mean, it's interesting because people talk about Katrina insulating New Orleans from the downturn in 2008. Mm -hmm. and. Yet that creates this foreboding feeling that uh oh we're headed for another thing like the oil bust in the early eighties that crippled the city for so long economically and so people are putting a lot I think into this basket in terms of uh, you know bringing the headquarters in yeah absolutely and you talked to some folks too who left New Orleans and so why are people leaving. Um, they're leaving because they're finding like they can't grow within their job. You can get to a certain point um, and they feel like there's no room to climb the corporate ladder here. Also, you know. So the, the, the top level corporate CEOs wouldn't be here, the, the, but the mid level people would be. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then also, you know, 
these issues, they come up in all of our reporting, crime and schools, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and affordable housing now is getting up there too. Yes, uh, so all of those sort of social issues mm -hmm. play into it. And you, you noted that Michael Hecht with Greater New Orleans Inc. Um, you know, uh, observed that usually these cycles take about 30 years and we're only about a third away into it. To, exactly. to see really sustainable economic growth. Mm -hmm. If you can look, you look at cities that have turned themselves around or really um, improved, like New York, um, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, mm -hmm. he even brought up Singapore as an example. They all have this 30 year time span and so we're 10 years in now and now we've got to do it without that sort of post-Katrina urgency. Right, and mm -hmm. one other thing that you noted too, um, that the, the, the folks who had been here pre-Katrina, the shop owners said, where did this NOLA come from? You know, we never <laughs> called New Orleans NOLA. You been. wrote it in an address if you didn't feel like writing the whole thing, <laughs> New Orleans, Louisiana. But now we're NOLA, that's yeah. kind of new. To the whole those <laughs> <laughs> the post-Katrina phenomenon. But you know, you think about New Orleans being able to compete, like for the Amazon thing. There are some things New Orleans has competed with very, very well, especially like in the world of sports. Mm -hmm. um, Super Bowls, uh, and, that Super that Bowls and Final Fours. But that's because we have a great facility which is located downtown. We're right for it. On the other hand, big industry, um, we don't have that kind of facility. And probably if they're talking about Eastern New Orleans, Eastern New Orleans is a more difficult sell. And, and so I think that's going to be part of the but problem. we do have prime real estate downtown. And, yeah. You know, the whole revamp of Duncan Plaza and what they're going to do with Charity Hospital. There are right. buildings and places where a large company could, with vision, I bet Amazon.com like Amazon would fit well in. in Charity Hospital. I think you're right. Let's start the movement. Okay, right let's there. start the movement. <laughs> All right. All right, we're going to move over to David right now. And Jefferson Parish president has a really pretty lavish office, it seems. Yeah, um, you know, he's a, this is Mike Yenny, we're talking about parish president, and he's been a lightning rod of controversy, and actually, coincidentally, it's a year today since I wrote the story about his uh, sexting scandal. Uh, but this, you know, is totally separate. I was looking at into invoices and other public records related to spending in his office, and there was a huge increase in public money going to renovations in the parish president's office. Um, but the most kind of interesting changes right in his inner office, he claims that he paid for himself. And that was basically to make it look like the Oval Office that George W. Bush had. I, the, everything down to the starburst rug that's specially made that says Parish of Jefferson, uh, um, uh, Parish of President, the, or Office, office of, the of the President, president Jefferson yeah. Parish, instead of Office of the President of the, the United, United States. States. And there's, you know, um, there's uh, chairs that look like the Oval Office chairs. There's a desk that actually looks like the Resolute desk that John F. Kennedy had in his Oval Office. Do those office. things stay behind when you leave office? Well, uh, according well, to him, he, he told me that he paid for them and that these are his things, mm -hmm. and so theoretically he would leave with them if he were to leave office. And he said that you know he's entitled to have it as nice as he wants if right. he pays he for Right, he says it. as long as I'm not spending uh, public money, I can make it as nice as I want, and I'm representing the parish, and we're bringing in people trying to get business and drum up, things like that. But it, it did cause a real reaction in the public to, you know, that this is a certain kind of narcissism or something that would cause you to represent yourself that way in the vein of a president of the United States. And But, you know, separate issue is what about the increase in spending? Because his predecessor had spent $415 on capital uh, office expenses for his entire staff, big staff, in his uh, executive offices in his last year. And here, the uh, Mike Yenny's first year, he spends, he has in the budget an increase up to $205,000. And the um, parish council is concerned, two of the two at-large council members said that they were concerned because they had only approved 100000 of that, not 200000 So. We'll see where all that goes. Uh, they're talking about doing an investigation, and I know that the inspector general has actually been looking into it because we have some emails that indicate And that. also, especially this is a, a president who I think a good argument can be made will not outlast one term. I mean, it'll probably be a, a one term but president. But you know, he's, you know, it has to be said that after I did the stories about the sexting and everything, he said, you know, I'm going to fight harder for Jefferson Parish and I'm staying in office even though everybody, the whole parish council, the various municipalities, the school board all called for his resignation. And, but he is still present and he's still there. And, yes. and to clarify also that all of these expenditures now were not just for 
his inner office or even his inner and outer office. It's for all of the executive right, offices. Right, the 23 the employees, including himself, who work in that division, mm -hmm. then that's actually in two different buildings. There's the Gretna government complex, and then there's also the Yeni building, uh, named for his grandfather in the Harahan area there. And some of those offices Elmwood. were empty? For, for all these years or something? Well, that he was saying that they didn't have, some of them didn't have furniture in them mm -hmm. when they took office. So he said that a lot of the, but you know, we questioned certain things like, uh, you know, sleeper sofas, mahogany mm -hmm. desks, things that were running thousands of dollars per piece. All right, are you continuing to look at receipts or ask for more receipts to? Uh, we've, we've asked for more and we've asked for clarification on some of the expenses or some of the items in his inner office. So okay. we're waiting on that. Okay, we'll see what you come up with in the future. Thanks, David. Over to Don. And we have a big veterans hospital now that's getting closer to opening all the way. It is, and I, I, I urge anyone who hasn't taken the drive down Canal, up Claiborne, up mm -hmm. Canal, sorry, Canal, Claiborne, Tulane, around the corridor that is the VA Medical Center and University Medical Center to just go take a look. Whatever you think about how the land was acquired and how it was built, it's a pretty impressive facility with real hospital campuses. It, it just... It's not like anything that's been here in the past. Mm -hmm. we, we t when we talk earlier about what New Orleans was like pre-Katrina, this was its something I, at least as a New Orleanian at the time, couldn't conceive of being here. Mm -hmm. It's very impressive. The ribbon was cut officially on the VA Medical Center last November, November 2016. Since then, they've seen 350,000 outpatient appointments. So the veterans really are coming to this facility. In July, they admitted the first mental health inpatient patient into their unit. In August, they began endoscopy procedures, which is the first time gastrointestinal exams are being able to be offered here. So that it just, things keep coming online and keep coming online. Recently, the optical shop opened on their campus. So there's eyewear for um, eligible veterans, accessible right there. In this whole facility, there's also a Veterans Service Center, which is now open. It's, it's kind of a one-stop shop for assistance. So it's not just your medical assistance, but you also get help from their partner, Veterans Service Organizations, the Veterans Benefits Administration, pro bono legal help, um, and a Veterans Experience Officer who's on site to help with that. This month, they also started seeing patients at an urgent care clinic that's on site. Um, that is avail It's right there in the heart of Mid-City but that's only for veterans. Mm -hmm. It's an urgent care clinic that's not accessible for other patients. They also admitted their first inpatient this month to the facility and hope to, by the end of this year, have about 70% occupancy in their 200 single patient bed units. Um, and they have performed their first outpatient surgical procedures. So it's all coming online. As of yesterday, the molecular lab on site is now open. It's one of only three at VAs nationwide. It's a lab where they do cutting edge testing for things like hepatitis B and C mm -hmm. and HIV. Um, they say they've accounted for a thousand new jobs and they will, in the course of a year, have 500 uh, medical students and other students rotating through um, as part of their partnerships. LSU with and Tulane. LSU, Tulane, Xavier, mm -hmm. all the local People partnerships. The health provider field. Um, and, you know, the treatments available range the gamut from endoscopy, like we talked about, a sleep lab, a pulmonary rehab lab, um, pain evaluation, neuro neurology clinics for headaches and seizures. So it, it it's a, a kind of a level of service for veterans that that hasn't existed, that hasn't here, for existed years. here since, since Katrina, since yeah. before Katrina, and it's more mm -hmm. than was here mm -hmm. since before Katrina. Um, next month, they'll be admitting the first residents into a community living center on site. They also are still working on the Dixie Brewing old Dixie yeah. building on site. That will become their research building. It's not open yet. They also, uh, I think there was a lot of talk before about some of the houses, the historic houses staying on their campus. Those are still underway too. They'll be houses for transitional living on site. Um, so it, it's, it, it's just definitely, if, it's coming it, along. It's starting to prove if, yeah. they, if you build it, they will come. They've already seen 20,000 more patients than, this, than last year. You know, so. the whole facility, I agree with you, it looks, it looks wonderful, but it's also, it's opened up the landscape. Uh, you drive down Canal Street and you look and you see this beautiful building that's St. Joseph's Church on Tulane. Mm -hmm. And all these years it's been blocked by other buildings, and now, and now well, it's now open. Now as you make the drive in from yeah. New Orleans East and you see the Superdome on one side to see this whole medical facility on the other side, it, 
I hate to use the expression, we look like a real city, but mm -hmm. you really do see more city-like things. It that, is, that, it's, it's, it's an impressive new. look. And it's also, back when there was a Dixie Brewery in, in that building, across the street on Tulane was Nick's Bar, which is a famous right. bar. Mm -hmm. Now they're rebuilding Nick's, right. and they're rebuilding that building. And there so are restaurants have a popping up around, and shops <laughs> popping up. Yeah. So a lot and, of changes on that corner. And homes Tulane in Mid-City are yeah. coming back, too. And it's wonderful that Nick's is coming back, isn't it? it is. Fond <laughs> memories of Nick's that we have. Okay, over to David. The home of the Banana Banshee, by the way. Yeah. That made it famous. <laughs> <laughs> Turbines, um, they're in our minds. No laughing and, matter. And, and, Turbines <laughs> are no laughing matter. <laughs> <laughs> turbine number four is a major turbine, been under repair for a long time, a lot of money, still not working. Right, I mean, this is really the, and Mayor Landrieu said this years ago, that the biggest problem of the Sewerage and Water Board is power, and the turbines are the central part. of These are the, the units that produce the power that run our system. Uh, and they like to say, hey, we have this, the best system in the world for this, these old turbines are great. But after Katrina, they really had major problems. There was uh, an issue where they used non-potable water, you know, bad direct water that ended up causing problems. And that really took out their main powerhouse, which is Turbine 4. And so they tried to fix it over the years. And then in 2011, they said, it's just, it's too far gone. We got to take it out of service and really do a refurbishment on it. And they got a ton of money from the federal government, over $150 million through, through the hazard mitigation grant program to do the work work on all these turbines, and the plan was turbine four would go first, take about a year, get it done, then move on to three and five and down the line with these old steam turbines and get them fixed up. And they never got to three and five because four is still out. And this is just dragged on could and on. get a new one for the amount well, of time and money they've spent. They've done, I, I counted up, they've done 80 change orders on mm -hmm. this thing. And the, just the cost just keeps growing and growing. And like you said, we, we looked at how much it would have cost to get a brand new one. And at this point, it would have been cheaper. Well, they tried to test it, what, this week? And we saw a Well, this exposure. month, they started yeah, the testing on it. And they had hoped to get it in back in service by the end of September and here we are the last day and uh, I don't think we're close because when they did do the testing on it there was a uh, there was a problem with one of the you know electric connections mm -hmm. and it, it 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 blew well so they keep working on this thing I mean do you get to the point where you say this just can't be fixed well and we go and get a new one or, or I mean how long is this going to continue I mean it was in 2013 and we have the video from the meeting where they say that it may not be repairable and they just apparently were not willing to accept that at the sewage and water board at this point I've done some analysis looking at the cost of brand new turbines and it looks like it would still be more cost effective to start to stop and start with a brand new uh, s facility essentially. Now there's an issue with uh, electricity that's generated, right? The 20, well, that's a 20 a, or versus you know, 65? It's not as big an issue as people make it out to mm -hmm. be. That's this thing with the old fashioned 25 right. cycle, 25, 25 yeah. cycles per minute uh, uh, turbine is per second, I should say, uh, they are running uh, at a different level than the typical electricity that we all use, which is 60 cycle. That, um, but they have power converters that do that, and they have those in place. And there have been some problems with those that we found, but uh, you know, this is not really that big an issue because they can convert that, and you don't and, lose a lot of the and energy. And of course, that's to run the pumps. So that's to run the pumps. So if you know, the pumps can be if they the pumps can be fine if you don't get the power to them. They're not going to do what they need to do. Okay, we'll see what ultimately happens with turbine number four. Right. All right, thanks a lot, David. Over to Errol, and we see football players um, taking a knee or sitting on the bench. Yeah, this is a story that I'm sure everybody wishes would go away, uh, and you know, let's enjoy football again. And, and it may have gone away quicker until last week when the president kind of stirred things up and just uh, the whole thing blew up all over again. And, it re and his comments really drove a lot of people into a corner that they felt like they had to do something, including the Saints, because the Saints had never really been involved in any of this protest until last week after the president's comments. And so you had this situation where the uh, 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 10 of the Saints players sat on the bench uh, during the national anthem. I know that was very disturbing to a lot of people here, and other people I'm, I'm sure agreed with it, but it, was, it just wasn't what you're looking for football for. But I think there's a story behind the story, and two of them, uh, Mark Ingram and Cam Jordan, first of all, they're the best of friends in, uh, in personal life. They were both drafted the same night at Madison Square Garden, and so they've both known each other, so they're really good friends. And they sat side by side, and at one part, both of them put their hand on the heart uh, during the national anthem. 
And Cam Jordan was at one point, you could kind of see him mouthing the words to the Star Spangled Banner. So that's sort of a, a mild protest. So on the one hand, you're sitting down, but you got your hand on your heart. But anyway, there's been a lot of talk going on um, this week. A key person is Drew Brees. I mean, uh, Drew Brees already has his chops as a, as a union leader for the players. And so I think the players respect him in terms of dealing with, with management, but also uh, his values are the values that I think that the fans go along with. And, and Brees is working behind the scenes. And I think also with Cam Jordan, who's the leader on the defensive side. And what Brees has announced is that what the team is going to do in unity is at the beginning of the game is that they're going to, they're going to all take a knee for a moment at the same time. But once the national anthem starts, they're going to all stand up at the same time and do it together. And he said this will be a unity. So I think the Saints are showing you know, real leadership. It's probably good that they're in London this week and you know, away from all that and can kind of act on their own. But, but maybe this will be a, a beginning the, to this. Some of the protests, there were protests last weekend in London, and that, was, that caused people to be angry because they were saying, because some of the teams stood for the they stood for the, stood for the national British national anthem and not, not the American one. But I mean, you know, this type of protest has been a part of sports for a long time. I mean, this is recalling in people's minds 1968 in Mexico City at the Olympics mm -hmm. with the uh, black players raising their fists during the national anthem, and you know they are doing it because they want to draw attention to you know issues that Colin Kaepernick first brought mm -hmm. to attention, and he's the only one who's. Lost not who's lost his job over it. Well, like John, I think John Bell Edwards has a good quote. Uh, you know, he's a graduate of West Point. He says, I'm a soldier. He says, I'm going to always stand for the national anthem. But he, but he says, he, he understands what this is all about. And he says, but there, guys, there has to be a more effective way to deal with these problems. And certainly the, the right, you know, that, so. to, uh, free speech, et cetera. Okay, looking ahead. Tomorrow, finally, the Wisner overpass is opening. So if you don't want to watch the Saints Sunday, just go and drive back and forth. Go to the <laughs> Wisner right, overpass. Right. Yeah, run, yeah because, because it's been like two years without it, and I'm ready. We need it. Let's right. drive back it's more than nice three hours. Right. <laughs> David. Uh, well, we're going, uh, we've just started a new Facebook page called Down the Drain at Channel 4 that our investigative team has started because we're looking more into all these issues related to the drainage problems in the city of New Orleans, and we okay. invite everybody to join the conversation. Down the drain. Right. All right. Take Bye. the night off from cooking Monday night for one meal, one night, one nation. Restaurants nationwide are donating a portion of their proceeds to hospitality workers affected by Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And mm -hmm. it's in way too many restaurants to name in our town, mm -hmm. but among them the Commander's Family of Restaurants, Emeralds, and all of the area Zia's are doing okay. it. That's Monday night. Great. Catherine. Well, I'm part of Tipping Point, that's what I'll be focusing on, and we're going to start reaching out to the 60 or 70 people who um, filled out our form online and said, mm -hmm. hey, we want to tell our story, too. So looking forward to sharing some of those stories as Terrific. well. Terrific. All right, and I want to tell folks about what we have uh, at WIS. Just go to WIS.org, and we have an online, we call online candidate forum, New Orleans Next Mayor. We interviewed 13 of the 18 candidates. We invited them all, 13 came. Um, all of them got the same set of questions, and they each got three minutes to respond. Unedited, we posted. So you can find that at WIS.org. The candidates did not get the questions beforehand, by the way. <laughs> and then also Informed Sources Special Edition this Tuesday, October 3rd, 7 p.m., a real focus on the election. So be sure to watch. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week also for Friday, on Friday, for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. The firm of Bowen, McCled, and Britt helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com.